Oh, hello there. You've just read Act 3, Scene 1 of Measure for Measure, haven't you? And you're desperate to acquire an even more detailed understanding of this scene. Well, you're in the right place. Stay tuned. You're watching Schofield on Shakespeare. Time for my summary of this scene, and I find the start interesting. Following the drama of Angelo's threats in the previous scene, we return to the prison to find our meddling, disguised Duke in conversation with Claudio. At this stage, the Duke doesn't yet know of Angelo's devilish offer and is apparently helping Claudio prepare for death. Yet, rather than talk about hope for heaven and eternal rest, he instead focuses nihilistically on the fact that life isn't worth clinging on to. Claudio, and by implication humans in general, isn't noble, valiant, happy or certain, so he might as well die. Plus death really isn't that different to sleep. When Isabella enters, the Duke asks to be put somewhere out of sight where he can eavesdrop on the siblings. She is clearly apprehensive and, like Angelo in the previous scene, beats around the bush before getting to the point. Claudio is initially horrified and appalled when he learns that Angelo is prepared to spare him should his sister yield up her virginity. However, with time to reflect, he starts hinting that Isabella might consider going through with the plan. Speculating about what happens to us after death is terrifying. Isabella reacts furiously and attacks her cowering brother for his cowardice and lack of honour. Having made this appalling suggestion, she now wants him to die and will even pray repeatedly for his death. The eavesdropping Duke then intercedes and speaks individually to the pair. He tells Claudio that Angelo was only testing Isabella and that he never had any intention of plundering her chastity. Thus, he should expect to die the following day. However, he takes a different approach with Isabella and he mentions in passing that he is surprised at Angelo's behaviour. He comes up with an extraordinary plan. Isabella should actually agree to go to bed with Angelo, but he will arrange for Mariana, a woman wronged and previously engaged to Angelo, to take her place. Isabella is delighted with this unexpected turn of events. So here are some questions, as ever, for you to consider. I'd recommend pausing the video in a moment to write some detailed paragraphs of your own before continuing the video to consider my ideas. So grab your pen, press pause. The video will resume in five seconds time. Question one, something rancid in her chastity, not by any means such a saint as she looks. How do you respond to Isabella in this scene? And to what extent do you agree with Sir Arthur Quiller Couch's views? What a splendid, mildly provocative qu quotation. Let's just quickly check on the exact meaning of rancid before delving deeper. So the suggestion may be that Isabella's rigid determination to hold on to her virginity and not engage with any possibility of sleeping with Angelo in order to save her brother's life figuratively stinks. It implies an obsessive, excessive, holding on to something which is unhealthy, causing a wasting away, a decomposition of self. We need to be clear about why Isabella is so protective of her chastity. And one explicit reason is given on screen now, with the lines taken from Act 2, Scene 4. According to her strict Christian beliefs, Having sex out of wedlock would be a terrible sin, 
resulting in eternal damnation. Given that her plan is to become a nun and thus devote her life to God, it is unthinkable that she would contemplate jeopardising her eternal life with God. So far, so reasonable. But of course, Isabella does not state her reasons for wanting to hold on to her chastity quite so calmly and simply in Act 3, Scene 1, when with her brother. Instead, she makes darkly suggestive comments about the consequences for Claudio should he want his sister to facilitate this as yet unrevealed possible way out of death. There are still Christian references, but ones which emphasise the evil of Angelo rather than her own faith and desire to experience heaven. Angelo is prepared to strike a deal with the devil and the consequences of going along with this will figuratively leave Claudio with a chain around his feet. With every movement for the rest of his life, he will be reminded of the evil of a theoretical past exaltation. And when Isabella does get to the point and reveals the truth about Angelo's shameful offer, which eventually leads to Claudio's suggestion that she might just possibly go through the ordeal for him, her subsequent language is startlingly virulent. She is far more interested in savagely attacking her brother than helping him understand her own religious perspective on the critical importance of preserving her chastity. She claims, without any evidence in the text, that her brother is a habitual sinning shagger, with the implication of trade being that he has sinned in this way with numerous women. Of course, as far as we know, Claudio has only slept with Juliet, and he did so with her fast his wife, just without the formal public announcements. She then goes on to make the distasteful suggestion that forgiving Claudio, letting him off, would lead to him indulging in other sordid transactional sexual encounters. This is also clearly unfair. Isabella has known and been close to Juliet for a number of years, hence her use of the adopted term cousin in Act 1, Scene 4. Thus you can presume she would have had a fair idea as to whether Juliet might be likely to be in a serious, exclusive relationship with Claudio, which will lead to a stable marriage. Her suggestion that Claudio being shown mercy would pave the way towards future degenerate, sleazy encounters is clearly ridiculous. Claudio simply wants to live and to be able to live his life with Juliet and their child. He is not Lucio and he is not Pompey. And the conclusion that he needs to get his death over with seems brutally callous, particularly in the light of her plea to Angelo in Act 2, Scene 2, that a brother should be given sufficient time to prepare spiritually for his death. And there's plenty more examples of extraordinarily vituperative language aimed at a presumably cowering brother. In David Thacker's 1994 TV version, Isabella even gets Claudio onto the floor and seems to throttle him. She declares that even if a simple body movement of bending down could result in her brother being saved, she would still want him to die. So much so that she would now direct all her religious energies to further this aim. It's just horrible, ferocious stuff. And what has it been triggered by? Simply Claudio tentatively suggesting that her sleeping with Angelo may not be such a sin after all and may even be seen as the opposite due to its life-saving consequences for him. Such violent attacks, such shameless use of Christian terminology to guilt trip as much as possible seem to back up Quilla Couch's view that Isabella may not be such a saint as she looks. But does she behave in this way because there is something rancid in her chastity? It's difficult to say for certain either way. Think of the context and the subordinate position of women within Jacobean society 
and a climate in which deeply held further Christian beliefs were commonplace. Isabella would surely be absolutely terrified at the idea of being pressured into going to bed with a strange man, having never had sex before, and believing that losing her virginity in this way would in all likelihood eternally damn her. So her extreme language and behaviour is prompted by her extreme terror, but also perhaps an unhealthy, unnatural obsession with her chastity, which needs to be corrected at the end of the play through the social and moral institution of marriage. And looking at her glib reaction to the Duke's proposal that she should deceive Angelo by agreeing to his indecent proposal, but sneaking Mariana into the bed in her place, similarly makes me uncomfortable. Yes, Mariana sleeping with Angelo will result in the latter having to marry the former, but Isabella's willingness to play her part in such a sleazy plan somehow seems at odds with the saintly image that she was so keen to develop in Act 1, Scene 4. And is it just an unfortunate coincidence that her choice of verb, grow, could be seen as a pun hinting at the likely consequences of Mariana and Angelo's shady lovemaking, namely female pregnancy? Is she not so far removed from the likes of Lucio that she might have us believe? Which brings us back to her extraordinary imagery in Act 2, Scene 4, in which she stresses the critical importance of her own chastity. She vows that, if sentenced to death, she would proudly show off whip marks. And masochistically strip herself. Rather than give up her uh, rancid chastity. Surely these lines show a repressed sexuality or a religiously directed strange masochism. Does the combination of sexual and religious imagery imply dark, untapped, underlying desires, and that Isabella's perspective on life and sexuality may be unhealthy? And given her crazed, psychotic outbursts in Act 3, Scene 1, could Quiller Couch have been onto something when he proposed that memorable phrase? Question two, a benign force for good. Explore this statement in relation to the Duke in Act 3, Scene 1. Well, I'm going to try to behave myself for a change and not less let personal irritations and prejudices get in the way. He comes up with an ingenious spur-of-the-moment solution to what is an extremely difficult, dangerous situation. His plan, if all goes well, and Angelo keeps to his side of the bargain, hmm, will have multiple marvellous outcomes. Namely, Claudio not being sentenced to death, Isabella clinging onto her chastity, ranted or otherwise, Mariana finally getting the intimacy she has yearned for with a man she loves, with marriage almost certain to follow as a consequence, and Angelo's true moral worth being publicly exposed and measured. Given that the Duke has only just found out about Angelo's dastardly plan, although he's a splendid snooper, even he wasn't able to be present in Act 2, Scene 4, when Angelo made his intentions clear, it is impressive that he has been able to think back to Angelo's past relationship and work out that Mariana may be able to come to all of their aids. I think it's also nice to see the Duke's humanity in his attitude towards Mariana. After stating that she still has the same loving feelings towards Angelo, there is implicit compassion in his imagery, which suggests that her love is like a river, which is flowing even more ferociously due to having to navigate a boulder. Angelo's unkindness was unjust, Yet this poor woman loves him all the more and suffers horribly for it. So although this plan may seem a little sleazy, and as I stated earlier, I find Isabella's rapid acceptance slightly disconcerting, it unquestionably shows the Duke as a benign force for good. 
With lives and chastity at risk, he has managed to come up with a complicated plan which has the potential to sort everything out. But there are other things about the Duke in this scene which I'm less keen on, namely all his deceit and lying. Lie number one. Angelo was only testing Isabella. Of course, his intention was never to abuse his position to nab at the treasures of her body. Instead, he merely wanted to practice his ability to figure out human character. It was all a bit of a game. Really? Whilst I guess there is a small possibility the Duke might want to believe this, his subsequent words to Isabella, as well as his own initial interest in seeing the effects of power on Angelo, make this extremely unlikely. And lie number two, claiming that he is Angelo's confessor, he almost certainly doesn't have one. Whilst these lies have the advantage of potentially reinstating a more amicable sibling relationship, Isabella won't be able to save her brother's life if Angelo never meant his indecent proposal, thus her brother won't need to nag her. Is he doing the right thing by stating equivocally that he is going to die the next day when he himself knows that through his own power and plan, that the doomed young fellow has a reasonably good chance of living? Is he right to extinguish hope here and give two very different accounts to brother and sister? Or are we already getting the impression of the Duke being more a power crazed manipulator in chief than a genuinely benign force for good? Something fervent later in the play when he brazenly lies to Isabella that Claudio has been executed. And does he really need to be so crude in his description of the event? And do benign forces for good need to be so undercover? In David Thacker's 1994 TV version, the Duke is panting, watching and listening to all the action from a CCTV room. It all seems a bit voyeuristic, but yet, of course, in order to save Claudio's life and Isabella's virginity, or keep the latter greedily for himself, perhaps it is necessary. Harold Bloom, within his splendid The Invention of the Human, suggested that, far from being a benign force for good, the Duke is Iago-like in his plotting and manipulative behaviour. An interesting comparison, but a little harsh given Iago's direct and indirect involvement in so many deaths. He stabs Cassio, Amelia, and his lies and stage management lead to Othello strangling Desdemona. Some critics feel that the Duke's plotting leads to a happy ending. This is hugely debatable, of course, and I can't wait to discuss it with you in a later video. From one splendid text to a simply awful one, Pauline Kiernan's filthy Shakespeare. If we trust her simplified, stripped-down translation of some of the Duke's reasoning to Claudio about why he shouldn't fear death, then we have another reason to question this shady man's character and integrity. That's all we've got time for. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production, beseeching you to think a little bit more carefully about Act 3, Scene 1 of Shakespeare's Measure for Measure.